Um, Betu Ashte, like she, how are you? Hello, Lexi. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm good. Good, good. Won't be long. It is 12 o'clock. People are still joining. It's it's a beautiful day. And I just wanted to say won't be long, Lexi, for always sharing your precious time with us as we do really appreciate mm. everything you do. Yeah, thank you. And so for everyone joining and for um all of our all of our families and friends that in our public, the public that's here and listening to today's teaching, um, like she, Richard Two Dogs, he is from Porcupine, South Dakota, Huyamani, and he helps us here at Friends of the Children, Khesapa, and the work that we're doing, working with our youth and the families and the spiritual and cultural guidance he provides us is very um, invaluable, very, we appreciate everything he does. And so we hope that you walk away today with knowledge and that we could share, continue to share his teachings with everyone. Um, I'll go ahead and hand it off to you, Lekshi Wopila. Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. I'm um, sharing my screen. Says I'm disabled participant. <laughs> there you go. I think I made our like she otter the <laughs> the co-host, but I think you should be able to now, like she. Bring up my PowerPoint first. All right. Can you see that on the screen? Uh huh. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Okay, um, we'll start with um, uh, talking about uh, interrupted journey. So um, this is based on uh, my grandfather's teachings. His name was Thomas American Horse. And uh, he was born in 1866. Um, I was fortunate to know him through my early part of my life. And he passed away when I was around 13 or 14 years old. Um, and so a lot of the things that I learned from him, like we lived with him. And he lived out to American Horse Creek, but we would bring him in in the winter times and he would stay with us because he got to the age where he couldn't be alone out there. But during the harsh winters, so... Uh, we would take him back in the spring, and he he couldn't wait to get home to get back to his home and um, live out there. And there's times when I stayed out there with him, too, and helped him. And I learned a lot of things from him. I look forward to the evenings when I was able to, when I was after all of our chores were done. Uh, we would settle in after supper, and he would talk to me and tell me stories. And... Uh, so one of the things that he taught me was the meaning of the what they call the changleshka, the um, the medicine wheel or the circle, and what that entails. So he said it represented uh, just more than one thing. He said people, uh, he never called it a medicine wheel. That's kind of a fairly new uh, 
interpretation of it. But what he said was in with it's in within this medicine wheel was a lot of meaning. He said the circle of life, the four directions of our universe, uh, and the center, he said, where we are to dwell all of the time if we're um, if our about if we are balanced in our life, he said we um we are always in the center of this wheel, he said. And we're, we're like Blackout said in his vision, where the four uh, directions uh, where they cross, it's sacred there. That's the Hochoka, the center, Hochokata, they could say, the center. So that's where we tie the plume um, and the medicine wheel. Oh, on the medicine wheel, that's where we tie the plume and the feather. So um, that's um, so in our altars, like the Inipi and the Sundance and the Lawampi and the Uipi ceremonies, that's where um, we create that altar, the four directions and the center. And from there, we get messages from uh, the creator and the spirits that help us every day. So, um, so the stages of life is the part that I got I took out of it and um we have a journey through life they say there's two great journeys in this life one from the spirit world the nariyata uh to here and then from here back to the nariyata so inside this time we go we go through four stages of life so um I'll go ahead and show the first um the first graph, so up on top, says Oinaji Dopa, the four stages of life, the Lakota way of life, or the Lakota worldview. So we believe that we dwell in the, the Nagiata, the spirit world. And when we pass from this earth, we return to the spirit world. So while we are here, uh, there's different, um, there's different things that, uh, we put in place as a people um, that strengthened us to this world. Um, so there's various, first of all, during the trimesters of, during the pregnancy, there was ceremonies in place. So soon as uh, a young woman knew that she conceived a child, her and her um, other half, uh, the first thing they put in place was a ceremony. And they make the prayers during this this time, the three uh, the tri the trimesters of pregnancy. So, the first thing is they make prayers for the child. And one of the things we never did was we never um, like prayed for a certain uh, gender. Like we never said, "I hope we get a boy" or "I hope we get a girl." That our ancestors never did that because we understood that it was because of the great spirit and the creator the, they were they gave us these children as gifts from Nariata. so we didn't say i hope i get a boy or i hope we get a girl like that whatever was given to us we would cherish them and raise them according to our way of life and our worldview so three ceremonies are made uh, during the trimester, and then when the child enters this world, then the fourth ceremony was done, and that was the ceremony of welcoming them into this world. So uh, we still do these welcoming ceremonies to this day. Uh, another thing was EOHI uh, Juntapi. Uh, you can see it on the graph there. It says pre-birth. So were they saying to the unborn baby, a mother is not exposed to anything negative. Family and extended family looks out for the mother and the unborn baby. So this was throughout the pregnancy too. So um, usually the second ceremony in the trimester was uh, the parents and the relatives would ask the spirits how this baby was coming, like both mentally, spiritually, and physically. And uh, I've seen where um, the family was warned that the child was developing something that was not good. 
like maybe uh, something that would hamper the child's life throughout their life. So uh, one of them would be like, say, if the child is de developing something like Down syndrome or I uh, even know of a ceremony where uh, the, fam the parents and the family were forewarned that uh, this child was going to be born blind. So they made ceremonies. Uh, doctoring ceremonies along with the you know, ceremony for the pregnancy and the child was born um, okay without being any kind of um, problems with their eyesight and then sometimes there might be like cognitive uh, challenges of the child maybe uh, they'll have learning disabilities or something so these ceremonies were done to prevent um, these things from uh, manifesting into something more serious. And so, uh, and then a lot of times uh, the spirits would tell if this child would would be gifted with, with any kind of um, like special powers, maybe of healing or uh, the ability to prophesy and things like that, or they might have um, uh, really high intelligence levels so that the families were told of these things too. And then on the last ceremony, before when the child, when the uh, mother is going into close to labor, then they would have the third ceremony. And so that's when they would uh, get her ready and make offerings that there'll be no problems at childbirth. And then when the child comes into the world and uh, within a few days, uh, the welcoming ceremony was there, was done, uh, and they had um, the sometimes close to that time would be the naming and then uh, the marking of the ears ceremony. So, uh, or even the piercing of the ears ceremony. So, uh, mm -hmm. those things were put in place to anchor this child to this world. So, the Oe the cleaning of the mouth by the grandmother, uh, path predicted for baby, Lakota name given soon after birth. Uh, the Pewiwila, the soft spot on the head is protected with uh, caps, uh, beaded caps that had a lot of times the um, family or the Teoshpa design. So at one time, each family in Teoshpa had a, a certain design. It was from maybe a dream or maybe an exploit of uh, the one of the ancestors or so uh, like in my family on my father's side I come from the American horse uh, Teospai and he was a chief and he was from the Kiyuksa Oyate the band of the Kiyuksa but he was from the Matro Oyate the bear people Teospai so uh, we still carry his um, design and we put it on our beadwork. To, uh, it's kind of like uh, to our identities. Uh, like people in England, they have a, they call it a family crest. But ours is the, um, the design of our, um, our Teospa. And it has a meaning. There's a story behind why that design is used, but. Um, that's usually kept within our Tiwahe and our Tioshpa. We're not allowed to tell them that part because of the spiritual ramifications of it. So you can't share sometimes a lot of things. But uh, these ceremonies were done and this cap was beaded and the child would wear the cap. And, um, protective Hewiwila, the soft spot on the head. Um, so as a child was uh, raised, um, there was like um, everything that he or she accomplished was was a uh, time to give them praise and let it be known, like among uh, the Tiwaha and Tiorspai, that he the baby had its first uh, steps walking and, and all. the first time he talked, his the first words that he had was always marked by some type of celebration. So the child would be um, uh, like when they had their first words, then 
they would allow they would um, have a meal and they would um, invite in an elderly couple and they would pray for the child and you know, um, give them teachings on speaking and how they're supposed to conduct themselves as a young a Lakota female, a young Lakota male. And because it was done through a ceremonial way, uh, a lot of these words that are given to them, they remember in later life. You know? And sometimes we think these are small children, so we think they don't understand, but they hear and see everything. And they're like tiny little um, tape recorders. And they, whatever they see, they copy it too. So whether that's positive or negative, whatever they see might be negative, so they'll copy it too. So um, so th that ceremony that is done at that time, the e uh, the cleansing of the mouth, um, would, it was done with the left hand on the ring finger. Um, and they would uh, clean the baby's mouth and then they would wash them in sage sage water, warm sage water, and then they would wipe them clean. And then uh, the the unchi that does the Iwe Chaijun Tapi ceremony makes a prediction for the baby. So they say uh, that prediction always comes true. So uh, when I was born, um, uh, my grandmother, my father's mother, who was born in 1880, is the one that um, helped my mother because I was born at home. I wasn't born in a hospital. So uh, she cut the umbilical cord and then uh, she cleaned my mouth and then she prayed with me and then she made uh, the prediction for me in my life. Uh, and she predicted someday that uh, that people would know me. I'll be known, uh, and that people will come to me for help. Her words in Lakota was "Tokata Takoja Wachinya So she foresaw in her uh, spiritual power that uh, someday that people will come to me seeking advice or help. And uh, she was you would what you would term maybe today a medicine woman. And it was through a dream of a horse that she got to uh, this position of like a, a person that uh, kind of like a midwife, but it was beyond that because she had spiritual wife, uh, power. She had spiritual like medicines to induce a labor child. Uh, induce a woman into labor. Uh, she had uh, medicines to clean, to wash out the afterbirth. And, uh, she had the ability to turn the baby if the baby was lying the wrong, the wrong way. She had that ability because a breach was a baby. So she had these abilities, spiritual abilities, and she could foresee like this child's future. So she, uh, back in the early part of the 20th century into, uh, I, I'm probably one of the last few that she um, delivered because she died when I was uh, 11 months old, right? About a month before my uh, first birthday, she passed away. So, but she, there, I used to meet people in my, uh, in my youth in the younger days of that in like around in the community of Kyle that would tell me that she in, in the community of Pine Ridge that she delivered she delivered the either delivered her their child or else she delivered um a dam. So like pre World War Two, a lot of young people came to me at that time. Uh, a lot of people came to me and said that your your grandmother delivered me. And some of them even to say said that um, if if it wasn't for her, they wouldn't have been born because they were born at home and they were like breech birth or the umbilical cord wrapped around their neck or something like that. And she helped them. Or some said they were uh, really sick, and she gave them 
as a baby, a newborn baby, she gave them medicines to help them. So uh, a lot of people look to her in that way. And her name is Helen Medicine Horse Two Dogs. So as we go through the life, this life, the four stages of life, the journey in life, we get past that period in our lives. And then we get to the age of around uh, 12 years old or plus. And the women, the young girls, when they have the first monthly cleansing, they would have the Ishnati Awichalawampi ceremony. And that's a ceremony, four-day ceremony, where um, they get teachings from uh, unchis and elder women and how to conduct themselves as uh, young women, to be virtuous young women. And then the Wichasha Twichasha uh, Ihonipi, the rites of passage. So we still practice both these ceremonies. And we should Wichasha Ihonipi is a young man is taken up uh, in the hills to hunt. At one time we didn't didn't have access to buffalo, so they would kill a, a deer. And when I went through my ceremony, my father took me. And we went west of Pine Ridge where the tribal um, buffalo herd is now. In that area, there was no buffalo herd there then. And then I killed a, a deer. And uh, we she, he, we took it to his cousin. Um, and and she was married to a man. His last name was Crazy Thunder. So we took the um, deer to them and we gutted it out in the hills. And then we brought it to them. And we told, she, he told, uh, my father told him what the ceremony was for. And of course, they knew about it. So um, I I gave them that whole deer. And me and my father stayed and helped him butcher it. And when we got done, um, the the old man sang a song for me, praising me that, that I helped him. And he said that from now, that day on forward, and I was considered a man. So, um so my father and my grandfather um, um, prayed for me and they took me into Inipi. And, um, my grandfather tied a feather on my hair. So I still have that feather to this day. And that's that's not the feather that I got when I got my name. I still have that one too. So when I got my name at um, a little over a year old, a man named Willie Wounded, who was a medicine man, he was a cousin to my father. He gave me, uh, he gave me his name. Oh, this name called Khmuya Money. So when I was, I received a feather then. But of course, I was a baby, so I don't remember. It. So that's how uh, these children are brought into our world and anchor them in this world because a lot of these babies can turn around and make their journey. Um, back to the spirit world. Well, she just call it sudden infant death syndrome, but uh, we as Lakotas know that it goes beyond that. If a child, when they first come to this world, they have the ability to go back to the other world at any time. Well, so if they're unhappy in this world, they can travel back to that world real easily. And that's why the khewiwila, the soft spot on the head is protected because they can pass out of that soft spot and go back to the spirit world anytime they feel like it. So in going in the journey around 21 to 50, usually uh, the young men and young women establish their own family and they begin the process of passing the teachings. A lot of the things that... Uh, they learned in the first two stages of life. They passed that to their children. So they established what they call a tiwahe. So the tiwahe is um, kind of the anchor or the root of uh, our world as Lakota people. So we have the tiwahe and the tiyoshpae and then the band from which we come from. So like I explained earlier in different presentations, I live in Porcupine, and I live among the Kiyuksa people. No, I live among the Wajaje people, which is my mother's people. And then uh, my father is a Kiyuksa from the area of Kaya. 
And so on my father's side, I come from that band. And the, and the Teoshpai is the Motoayate, the bear people of who, of who uh, American Horse was the chief. He was one of the major chiefs of the Kiyuksas, along with him and a man named Little Wound and a man named Pawnee Killer. They were the principal chiefs. And there was others too, other chiefs like um, of, of different bands of different cures, right? So when you reach the age of 50, uh, you're considered an elder in the Lakota worldview. So elder role includes providing teachings, ensuring social custom and spiritual order is in place. And a lot of times I remember seeing these elders come and they'll tell what they believe and they'll say what they think is being done wrong. At, at any place and those of you that are old enough to remember and it still happens from time to time is these elders go to the tribal council meetings and give the council sometimes a pretty good tongue lashing but i've even seen elders stand up at sun dances and say that they're doing things and wrong you know which um, a lot of times hurts people's feelings a lot of it is the truth. You know, they've seen it, they lived, they lived it. It's a lived experience, and they know when something is being done wrong. The people are playing with a certain ceremony or playing with something. You know, like the the governmental, the governmental structure that oversees the reservation. They see. You know, whenever uh, there's something is being done wrong, then they'll they'll be quick to uh, they'll be quick to um, point it out. And unfortunately, a lot of these um, elders are now gone. So it seems like you know, now uh, people are kind of out of control. Uh, but in all of this, uh, how much we maintain and hang on to makes us the who we are as Lakota people. So um, the, the the thing that holds us all together is called Wotakwe. Wotakwe is like the kinship, the kinship system and everything that, that is within the kinship system, the social boundaries, uh, the teachings, how we interact with each other, all of that is part of the wotaki, the kinship. And so um, we have to keep that strong in order to survive as Lakota people. And so the more we lose as Lakota people, we might be Lakota by blood, but if our worldview and our belief is gone, then, you know, the question would be, and it's a it's usually always a point of debate is is are we still Lakota? And some people will argue, say we are, some people will say we aren't. And I guess it's it's up to each person's um, viewpoint on how they see it. Um, but it's always a point of contention in in our among our people. So in the interrupted journey, uh, we come from the Nariata, the spirit world, three births. Uh, there's a very, very good chance the three, the four ceremonies of the trimester uh, aren't done. These children, the young girls are getting iglus uh, aka with child, as we say in our language. And uh, the ceremonies are not being done for them. Um, and the interruptions began uh, early, like an example given is abandonment, sexual abuse, trauma, maybe at age three. Uh, maybe this child is abandoned or physically abused or sex sexually abused. So that impacts their life. It determines a lot of times if they're not there's not uh, spiritual interventions for this child at an early age. The 
it's determined then their path in life and their path in life will be um, a lot of times they will turn to drugs and alcohol and, uh, and then they fall into like a rut of early uh, be becoming um, with child at an early age, the young girls. Uh, the fathers will father children and then not take the responsibility of being a father. So the teachings are no longer there from, from uh, the kaka and chi, the grandparents. A lot of times uh, there is no grandparents present. A lot of times maybe the grandparents passed on or because the grandparents are into addiction themselves and they're not fulfilling their role as uh, grandparents. And a lot of times the grandparents are even are even the perpetrators on their own grandchildren. So that's what is happening today. So there's no ceremony to bring them into this world to acknowledge them, to acknowledge their achievements in life. All of these things um, are no longer there to in, ensure a safe uh, journey into this world and a safe journey walking in this Changleshka of life in the four stages. So the child, after around the age of 12, and even now it's happening younger, is there will be suicide attempts and completion. So we lead the nation in the Aberdeen area, which is the area we live in under the BIA, is that we lead the nation, the lower 48 states, in suicide attempts and completions, and it's three three times the national average. The only places that are higher than us is um, the uh, places up in Alaska, the villages up there, the, the people that are up there, their suicide rate is higher than ours. And so that's amazing when you think about it. If we're three times the national average, then they're even higher than that. So... And, you know, it'd be interesting to know, you know, what is going on up there, you know. I mean, we know what's going on down here, but it's it's probably pretty much the same thing, except it might be uh, on higher levels. So um, when we pass into around adulthood, into the age of 21 and up, we see a lot of our relatives living on the streets. Alcoholism, drug addiction is uh, a big part of these people's lives so backing up uh, there's no ceremony for the transition into adulthood there's no ishinati uh, awichalawampi ceremony there is no awichasha ihoni ceremony uh, those things are not done anymore in 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 a large part of our society as Lakota people. So we see our relatives down there walking and it's be interesting and I don't know if anybody has ever or will ever do a study of our relatives there at uh, on the streets not only in our communities at, on the reservation but up there in Rapid City. So uh, the question should never be What's wrong with you? It should always be what happened to you. So they all have a story. Um, and so what is happening to our people, as we know, is generational. You know, it's we're we're about three or three or four generations into this uh, alcoholism and the interruptions to our journey in life as a people. So these people uh are there uh, and where they end up is usually dead, found dead on the streets. They die in a hospital of alcoholism. And uh, the, the solution to the society out there is building more prisons. So 
I heard through new, the news media that they're going to build a large prison there for women in Rapid City. And then a new prison is being built on the eastern side of the, uh, the South Dakota. So what they're going to do is incarcerate our people rather than saying, you know, how do we heal? How, how can we help you to heal? The answer is to build larger prisons and more prisons, and which is, a, to me, it's not uh, he healing our people. And if we're given the resources, we can heal ourselves, I believe, and we can help ourselves. But the solution is to incarcerate our people because you go to the JDC, you go to Pennington County Jail, you go to any one of the prisons, there's a high uh, population of our native people. I would say in, in the South Dakota State Penitentiary, I'd say it's like 50 to 60 percent of population. And it's pretty high, and these other ones clear down to like the JDC there in Rapid City. I mean, fall in there, and there's there's a lot of uh, native youth in there, and not only that, there's a lot of people, young people of color. And there's a lot of Hispanics in there, uh, African Americans. Uh, I even met a young man from Puerto Rico who couldn't speak English, so he had he had some kind of a device that translated for him, but he hung in there with the native youth. And, um, smudge with them and all of that. So um, they uh, so so the 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 answer to me is not building more jails, even though it's a business. So I was studying this on a looking at information on the internet and in California when they built those pr prisons, like there's one called Susanville, where a whole town sprang up around this prison. They built the prison, they brought in the people, then they built a town around it. So there was like, uh, there was apartment buildings and buildings and shopping malls and stores and all this um, topped up around this one prison. So that's what's going to happen in Rapid City and in the eastern part of South Dakota. They're going to, you know, wherever... Uh, wherever these prisons are built, it's going to increase the population around it. So um, and there's almost, I see as the, the society around us is keeping us unhealthy uh, on purpose because there's money to be made off of our unhealthiness or what, what happened to us as a people. And I know Washitas will argue with me, but I don't care because that's the truth. They just don't want to face it. So that's what I see happening in our in our communities is that rather than finding curing some kind of way to cure ourselves to help us, we can do it on our own. We just need um, help of some type, whether it's financial or you know like that, or even an open mind, you know. A lot of times when we try to go into the Rap City school systems, uh, we're met with opposition because they don't want us. They don't want the natives going in there to help their own children. So this is the interrupted journey. So the, there's the um, natural journey and then there's the interrupted journey. So this is what's happening to our people and well we're kind of pretty much left i feel to fend for ourselves and so we have to go and try to help ourselves as the people so i and my mahasani my better half discussed it one time and one of the things we came up with was these uh, youth healing camps we have in the summer and the fall and in there, these children come and we give them the opportunity to play, have fun, but we also give them the opportunity to heal and get a Lakota name. A lot of them, a lot of them come to us without Lakota names. And 
So uh, and a wall back into spiritual cleansing. And some of them, when they get the wall back into it, they get new clothes. And some of these children, it's the first time they've ever gotten new clothes. So they're really like happy about it. So some of them say, when can I do the next one? Because they want to get new clothes again, which, you know, I can understand because they come from families that have like a lot of, uh, well, they're, they're living in poverty. They don't have um, resources to get these things. So they watch TV. Those ones that are fortunate enough to have TVs, they see what the outside society, very young people have. You know, they have video games and clothes, and iPads, and computers. They get to go on vacations, you know. Things like that. So when we take these children to the Black Hills, they they really enjoy that. They get to ride those paddle boats and they get to fish and all of that. So these they're really, I think, healing these camps. They heal these young people. So, uh, so Jean, uh, I guess this today will be. Uh, a slow, a short presentation. So we right. have just the two uh, slides. And... Mm -hmm. It was, no, it was really good. Like she, I mean, the conversations, the knowledge, just from your teachings, it helps us in contemporary society, you know, think about what's happening, what's happening to our people. And like yeah. you said, instead of saying, you know, why are you acting this way? They should ask, well, how did, what happened? You know, how can we help? Instead yeah. of building more prisons and more of these places that are not going to help us, but really mm -hmm. trying to understand that historical generational trauma that has happened and continues to affect us today. Yeah, that's true. Even even so, with these prisons, if they allow us to more freedom to come in there and work with our uh, work with our uh, people inside there, then it would it would be a great help. But they have us, you know, jump through a lot of hoops just to come in there. You know, mm -hmm. I like when I go through, you know, at the gate at South Dakota State Prison, then they search my uh, suitcases, my pipe in there, and my stuff. And mm -hmm. I had a preacher walking walking in front of me, and they didn't search him. So I I, I asked him why, and, and they came up with this excuse. I had to take these classes and then be sort of you know get a certification certification or something certification. But you know I don't think that that person that preacher did that. He just got to go through because he was washicha. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's that's so unfortunate and like you said even in getting into the schools and helping our, our students in the schools mm -hmm. has always it's always been a challenge um mm -hmm. because we know institutional racism and these systems were built on that and mm -hmm. continue to perpetuate into these systems and it makes it challenging for us to disrupt them and i think that you know these teachings you know sharing this knowledge and and the programs you know the nonprofits out there thinking about like owaye luta kolakichi and you know us what we're trying to do here really trying to reconstitute our kinship systems that have been broken due to that cultural genocide due to um genocide altogether assimilation all these things it's it's so that our children that when they're going to continue to be in these systems, however, they get to be inherently Lakota and empowered to feel to be themselves and not yeah. be afraid of that and not to be ashamed. Yeah. So that's going to come a long way. And they're the ones that are going to continue to fight these systems. And we will see that generational change happen. Mm -hmm. That's true. Mm, we do have a um we do have time for questions and I see that one of our participants, Tara Engel, she asked, you know, you were giving the, the teachings about the ceremonies when our, you know, babies are, when they're born and, and what our elders can do for them and bring them into this world. She asked, how can we help 
the Lakota children that don't have familial elders get back to, you know, teaching that four stages and ceremonies. Did we get back to it? Yeah, is, if they don't I have think, access. I think we could make it into a curriculum where it could be taught. I don't know if the school allow, would allow it, but Mm -hmm. We got it. We could find a venue somewhere that could um learn it. Uh, one one would be like say YouTube, like mm -hmm. or like what we're doing right now today. Mm -hmm. It's being recorded and it will be on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Are there any more questions for um like she Rick today? Or comments. Well, I have questions, you know, I always do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what could, what could, you know, folks that are wanting to relearn and, you know, with these healing camps, like you talked about, how can they become involved or how can they assist in those types of revitalization efforts, those, you know, the healing camps and helping our youth and the families that we work with in our communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things is like, uh, what is your expertise? Like, say, um, you have a certain knowledge and maybe how to do coal work or bead work, like that. So um, those people can reach out and, uh, the camps are all on um, social media. There, there's a Facebook page for each one. Mm -hmm. And someone just asked, what's the link to for the youth healing camps? And so, um, Tui Linda, are you, are you out there? Can you help assist? I know that you're part of that planning too. Hi, good afternoon, relatives. Good afternoon, Ate. <clears throat> yeah, we're we're um in the middle of planning right now for the camps that will happen in August and we'll be getting a um application out there soon. So just watch for it. We'll be taking 20 uh youth per camp. We'll have three camps going at once. And um yeah, um just watch for that. It'll be coming at August. 6th through the 10th are the camp dates. So that'll be happening soon. Catch mm -hmm. it. We'll be on. We'll share that too on Friends of the Children social media so everyone has access to that. Let's see. There's a comment here from Susan Hawk. There is a need for cultural, spiritual, spiritual teachings and psychiatric residential treatment facilities because it is absent or there's inconsistency and non-continuity. And so, Lakshi, what are your thoughts on that? Mm, yeah, I agree with her. Uh, like say, anybody we have to deal with as indigenous people here, especially in South Dakota, is underfunded and understaffed. Um, like say, more at any given time on the Pioneer Reservation, there's an estimated about 45,000 people here, and uh, there's only one psychiatrist, if there's one at all, covering all these people. And then we have clinical psychologists, and if we do have any of those, there'll be at the most one or two. So, mm -hmm. so we're these, the, the reservation is really understaffed and underfunded. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the tribal council is doing their best to get funds and, and you know, um, get a lot of these programs funded, but they, they pretty much fall on deaf ears because uh, the white America out there portrays this idea that we get free housing, we get free 
health care and free education. And we're doing pretty good on the rest. And in fact, they perpetuate this constant lie that we get money every month for being Indian, as they say. You know, mm. and those are all those are all stereotype type of uh, beliefs and they think we're doing pretty good because when I travel like on the outside the res and planes and stuff I have conversations with these washitos and they think we're living a pretty good life down here you know mm. we're being well taken care of but we're not and mm -hmm. a lot of the people that control the funding like in congress uh, they know the truth but they're not going to acknowledge it you know mm -hmm. I mean, they send uh, billions to Ukraine, you know, just imagine if they sent us billions, what we could do, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, like she and, and along that same sense too, I know that like she, Jean, and has talked about this quite a bit at Oaie Luta Kulikichie, that our residential treatment facilities don't have that cultural component. And that's why, you know, it needs to be done off of our thought processes as Indigenous people, not the other way. And Tui Athlean says that all the way as well. Organizations, they sh it should be built off of the foundation of Lakota thought and philosophy, not the other way around. And then putting mm -hmm. the the processes of how um, Western psychiatry and all of those things act, it should be the foundation first and then bring that in. And so mm -hmm. that's why it doesn't work and you don't see that as often. And so, um, okay. There's another comment here. Joey, Wopila Takashi, very powerful presentation and knowledge. The Lakota people have the resources and teachings to heal the people. And it's a huge empowerment in the life journey, as you know, and provide. This echoes a previous question. How do you help? How do you go in helping professionals support their work to help in the process while being respectful to sacredness to their work, especially since the certain systems need evidence or proof of the existence to the work? And so like that's those evidence based evidence based practices, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we know that. Our ways work because it helped us to survive, you know, to this point. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of it is, was, you know, based on prayer, our belief, our Teospi system, how we helped each other through the hardest of times, you know, because the genocide was designed to eradicate us completely, mm -hmm. but they couldn't do it. And we survived and we're still here. We still have our language. And we still have our ceremonies. Mm -hmm. So, they weren't successful. What they should be learning is from us is how to how to survive, you know, because they're gonna they're gonna come to that in sometime in the future. Mm. Uh, you know, the history of this country. Mm -hmm. They're gonna encounter the things we did are they're encountering it now. You know? mm -hmm. Well, Bila, like she and I know you continue to speak on this. You and Tui are so knowledgeable and help help us here at Wakayaja to Wolokota. And, and I, I think you constantly talk about, you know, when it comes to Western systems attempting to take this and, you know, whether it's cultural knowledge and the way that we help heal our people, it's us doing the work for us and by us as Indigenous people. And that's mm -hmm. how it's done. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times it's it's you know the non-native folks that are it's wanting to learn how to do this way but it it can't be taught it can never be taught in that manner because it's us that are going to help heal us mm -hmm. and so and it's kind of you talked about it too it's kind of hard for them to hear that um mm -hmm. because there's funding tied to it there's there's all of those things and i think i really liked that term that practice based evidence that we've been doing this for hundreds and thousands of years our way of mm -hmm. life how you, how you would say it it's not it's not some you know it can become a curriculum but it doesn't have to be because it is our way of life right yeah that's what i learned from you all every day mm -hmm. that's true let's see 
Does anyone have any other questions or comments? Wopila Ate for all that you do for the people you are cherished, said to me, Linda. Okay. All right. Well, if that is all the questions and comments for today, I just want to um, continue to say Wopila to Lekshi, Wopila to all of our participants who joined us today. This has been recorded and it will be up on our website, up on YouTube. Um, if you follow us on social media, we do have a YouTube and all of Lekshi Rick, Rick's teachings are there. So you can certainly use them He, with his consent. Um mm wanting to relearn and reteach our way of life. And so this um, teaching was provided by the, the South Dakota Humanities. And so there will be a short survey after the conclusion of this teaching. If you can please complete that, all of this, we're going to, after all his teachings are completed, we'll be able to comprise that information shared and, and give that back to like Shirik. Um, and so because we do appreciate everything that he does, that's really helpful for for all of us. And so have a great day, Wopila Lekshi. I hope you have a wonderful day. Mm -hmm. And take okay. care. All right. Well, Doksha Ake Wachyam Kikte. Doksha.